I'd uh, like to firstly say thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, I suppose sometimes it's useful to start some of these presentations. I hate saying it this way, uh, but with a bit of an apology, because I hope that I uh, don't stir up a bit of a hornet's nest. But I think in the spirit of upcoming elections and changes in policy and promises that we hear from people, it's, uh, I always say, as a, as a practicing scientist or a, a hopeful practicing scientist addressing a forum of of learned people and colleagues in the industry and people who have come in the spirit of having a good debate about where we are going into the future, mm -hmm. that sharing controversial ideas, stirring things up a little bit, uh, helps to, to broaden our, our collective understanding of the challenges that we do face. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely. in answering some of the questions and looking at some of the brief, I said to myself, how, how best could I potentially contribute to this so that we share some ideas, foster a debate, um, hopefully as we move forward in our different contributions in the energy fora we are in, in the science and technology arena, in education, everywhere that our, our collective tentacles stretch to, that we can we can strengthen our contribution and and help towards something that is practically implementable. Because I understand with, with policy and many of the debates, we're in a space where there's a lot of contestation of ideas. And whilst I would say through my, my years of experience and exposure to a lot of these fora, that in South Africa, one of the things that we are very, very good at is debate and policy formulation. But equally, one of the things and one of the areas where we're not excelling and we need to really ramp up if we're going to make the difference that we would all like to make is to get to a point where things work practically for us, where we can implement. So our implementation skills, capacity and ability really needs to meet some of the challenges. So if you ask me, what are those challenges? I, I looked at some of these things and I, I listened often to the different debates. And I look at what's hope happening in our energy are uh, arena. And for a population of 61 million people, approximately, um, we, we hear these numbers of 22 million people on social security or grants. When we look at taxpayers of this population, there are 7.2 million taxpayers as of the last tax submissions that I saw. Um, and that's individual people paying PAYE. And many people say to me, but you forget that people across the board are paying uh, various taxes, VAT, et cetera, on goods that they buy, et cetera. And my point is that's understood. But if we look out of 61 million people that only 7.2 million are actually affording and earning salaries that put them in a tax bracket where they can be taxed, we are sliding backwards. We are not moving forward. It's a it's a flag that I raise. General unemployment, we know that number. Youth unemployment, more alarmingly for me, uh, if I look at that and I hear people debating and going, is it 51, is it 49? My point is anything above 10% should be ringing uh, huge alarm bells. Uh, GDP growth, we also hear these numbers and we look at the revisions that constantly hit our, our screens and we say, well, how are we going to move these figures forward and against the backdrop of 15 years of load shedding, cost of unserved energy skyrocketing, tariffs going up, but we are asked to cut back. Uh, efficiency is great, serves a purpose, but surely at some stage we need to say we need to be providing uh, that which we need to drive an economy, an economy that needs to compete. And we'll look at some of the numbers a little bit later. But some of the numbers of where our counterparts in the BRICS countries are growing, where they are applying their skills and aptitude, and we see that we've got a lot of running and catch up to do. And I think for me, that's the context. So when I, I then share some of this and I look at our ambition, and cheekily I raise this issue about what is our real ambition as we move forward, um, I, I just use one thing in the energy context where I did read in the brief that there was some statements made saying renewable energy is new, 
Is this a technology that people understand? Is it not too expensive? Uh, we often label it as alternative energy, but I say alternative to, to what? It's, um, it's rather it's another technology in the mix of technologies. Uh, we see that clearly in the integrated resource plan. We're making more and more allocation to looking at using our indigenous resources. Um, and there's a particular rationale, and I'll explain that now. But if I look at our policy target and just cast your mind to those two maps, one's of Germany, one's of South Africa, and we often liken our solar policy to that of what's happened in a, in a country like Germany, where you see the kind of rollout that's happened over the years, and they've got a fraction of the natural resource that we have. We're catching up, but ever so slowly. And the question I have is, how long will it take us, given our resource and the scale of our country, to actually get to a position where we are a leading light, where we are taking the latest technologies, uh, where we are developing our own? And you'll remember some of our solar technologies developed here. Nobody wanted to use them 15 years ago, so they were sold to Germany. And it's one of those things from a, a, a technology uh, and a science point of view where we say we have this situation where we excel. We have brilliant minds that develop stuff, but we can't implement it in our own country because our policies and our mindset to adopting new technology tells us that we don't want to take that leap. Um, we'd rather take a leap on other things but we don't want to take the leap that we need to to catapult our economy forward. Yet we've got the resource base. So it's just starting to think about when we design policy, when we look at ambition, when we look at marshalling the funding into new science and technology to solve societal problems and to position our country in a situation where growth is sufficient in order to deal with those indicators that I put on the table why we seem so reluctant? Why do we talk ourselves down into a corner? Why do we not take that bold leap forward? Um, and this is a question that I think many of us need to find a way to resolve. If I simply just quickly look at what I call results when I again come to the brief and I hear people saying to me, well, we don't know whether renewables or we don't know whether the energy technologies we're looking at actually will make a difference. I just go back to some of the reports I read, and it's it's not my research. It's a work that many, many people uh, from the CSIR, e Business Intelligence, Meridian Economics, even the DMRE's own uh, research team that put these together. And I just look at what has happened over time, just from the cost, never mind the technology, which has been adopted worldwide in the many gigawatts worth. Um, so it's not a new technology, this renewable technology. It's It's been around for decades. Uh, other countries are grabbing at it and expanding it for a particular reason we'll come to. But I look at what it's doing from a money point of view. I look at what those contributions are. I look at the pricing, and it's real pricing, out of bid window tariffs. And we look at it and we see that we're making good headway from a pricing point of view from where we were in 2011 where we are in 22 and in 23, it's even cheaper. So against rising costs of electricity supply, um, unserved energy crippling our economy, um, the need to implement more, get more going against the backdrop of uh, a more expensive fossil fuel mix, uh, of which we are still going to pay the costs in many different ways. But at the end of the day, we're looking for a solution where we can contribute, where technologies can contribute that are actually going to fuel our economy. And bearing in mind, behind renewable energy, particularly wind and solar, there is the whole focus on free fuel renewable energy, meaning we don't have a fuel cost. Sure, we have a conversion cost, we don't have a fuel cost. That fuel cost hedges us against the volatility in the fossil fuel markets, in the petroleum markets, etc., and helps decouple a little bit from that growing risk of the volatility around the world. And that is something that South Africa has an abundant resource in. So if we're seeing lower prices, we're seeing free fuel, there is an economic rationale that says 
we should be doing more of this, not less of it, but we certainly do need to find a way to speed up how we are doing this. And it's that implementation I referred to earlier to say, we seem to perpetually play catch up with the rest of the world. We're not short of ideas. We're not short of people needing to take them up. We're not short of the application in our society, whether it's solar panels on informal settlement roofs, and we've got those examples, they do exist, communities generating electricity for themselves, selling them back to municipalities, larger municipalities, larger users. There are many examples as our market's evolving. Um, I simply look at this to, to tease out some more ideas about where we see things growing over the next five years. And if I look at that left-hand slide and what our colleagues in China are doing, um, an economy like that, we would argue, might be a pace setter. Um, and I've only used them as a, one example, never mind Brazil, never mind India, amongst, let's call it the developing economies and the stronger economies that are reaching out. I haven't looked at Indonesia's market, which is booming, particularly at the smaller scale. But I do say if our, our, our other countries out there that whom we compete with are doing this, and are reaching out and it's working for them because they've realized the benefit they've got, the brain power behind it. We, we as South Africans are importing tons of solar panel. It's all uh, put together in China, manufactured in China. Um, we've got to look at how we extract more value out of this energy supply chain, but that's just one area with some facts there that we need to, to put into the mix for debate. But if we look at local project projections, I think those are quite bold. I've taken those from Green Cape market projections, and I've taken them from Meridian Economics, and they give us a very good insight into what is actually happening on the ground, how much implementation is happening, and where it's been driven from. It's not been driven because of government policy necessarily, because that helps. It's one enabling arm. But it's about people going out and saying, I'm going to do this. We need to do this. We need to do it because we need to solve a particular economic challenge and problem. And we've we've got to get lower energy prices. We've got to get stability into the system. We've got to enable technology. We've got to open the door to players out there in our marketplace who can get things done. Um, and I, I just want to deviate slightly for 30 seconds to talk about the young South African who invented uh, a an electric scooter, not necessarily the drivetrains, but uh, put together the scooter and went to one of the funding institutions at EFIs and said, I've got this opportunity. Guys on delivery bikes out there uh, are getting flattened. This is a safer model. This is a safer machine. It's more visible. It can carry more. Uh, it protects people from the elements and it's an electric model and it's going to work off charging stations at the various big supermarkets as they change uh, charge their fleets. It'll help delivery at a local level and it's all 100% uh, South African. And of course, the chap could not get funding, could not get finance. And that's a sad tale for ourselves because we're not putting our money uh, behind people who are bringing innovation, who are using technology. We are not backing our scientists. We're not backing our entrepreneurs who are implementing those ideas. So we seem to be reluctant, as I've said before, to step into the breach and say, this does work. It's worked overseas. Other people are doing it. Other markets in Africa are doing it. Why do we seem to be so hesitant to give ourselves a vote of confidence and take that bold step forward. So I've just raised some of that to the, the in the right hand side boxes there, just to show in different cities the number of projects and megawatts that are happening. And despite policy confusion, reluctance to move forward, it's happening. It's something we defined in SAPVIA at the time as the the silent revolution that was happening because we had to get up and do it for ourselves, uh, lest we get left behind where other markets are moving. So that South African ingenuity, the South African proactivity, the hunger and the drive to get things done is being muted, but it's still there. And I'm arguing that as we move forward, we find ways to unlock this, that we don't tie ourselves down necessarily 
in waiting for some policy. Let the policy catch up with practicality. But let's back our innovation, our ideas, our technologies, and the people behind them. The question really I do see also in that brief is, what does it mean for jobs? How do we stimulate this? How do we reverse through the proactive use and clever use of our energy supply and our indigenous resources, where we can see prices dropping, where it can see it becomes more affordable as we move forward, because we've seen the implementation happening around us. Does it create jobs is the question I often get asked. Um, and I tend to say, yes, it does. But I'm leaving you with some of these numbers um, just to show off an 86 megawatt PV plant where these jobs are being created. Um, does it solve the problem in its totality? I'm sure it doesn't. Does it make a fundamental dent in our view on what we need to do and where it can make a, a, an impact? Yes, it certainly does. It certainly tells us that if we become proactive, we push harder, we get the implementation right, just in the energy sector and one small fragment of the energy sector. It's not the whole energy picture. It's one small part of it, but it's a fairly significant part that makes a very significant dent and impact in our economy. And that if we get our ducks in a row, if we look at how others are implementing, and we put more confidence and backing behind our ability to implement and show a little bit more, yes, it's probably confidence in ourselves to go out and just get it done. Uh, I don't want to quote famous politicians who have phrases around that, but it certainly tells us if we stand up and step forward and get it done, we actually can do it and we should have more confidence and more belief in ourselves. But more importantly, we should not be sitting necessarily questioning every little thing, debating it to the nth degree, sitting in talk shops, not that these talk shops are not valuable, but we do need a fundamental shift away from this perpetual cycle of, of putting things into the policy, um, let's call it hamster wheel, if that's the right phrase to use, but to get out of there into implementation mode and particularly use our indigenous technologies, our indigenous thinking, our indigenous resources with the sources of money that are there. And they are there. The finance is there to back them. But just stepping forward, making sure that it works and creating those opportunities where we can take those vast numbers of unemployed youngsters, particularly in this economy, who would like to step into the gap and push things forward. We need to create that opportunity. And I see energy and the coming change that's actually with us, that's going to accelerate in my view, creating that opportunity, that gateway, that set of opportunities mm -hmm. to move into the future. Thank you, Chair. I hope I haven't overstayed my welcome, um, but I certainly believe that there is an opportunity for us to move uh, ahead speedily in this regard. Thank you.